Welcome back to Curious Archive. This video is a new chapter in my long-running series exploring the incredible speculative evolution project of Serena, the world of birds. Serena was created by Dylan Beta, a terrific artist and world builder, and many exciting developments have occurred since we last explored his creation. You may remember the fascinating premise of the Serena project. An unknown force leaves a colony of finches on the moon of Serena, along with a few other plant and animal species to serve as their food supply. The project imagines the amazing life forms that evolved from these humble beginnings over millions of years, creatures that I've explored in past videos. For this entry into the archive, we'll chronicle the next era in this evolutionary epic and witness the rise and fall of countless species as the world of Serena continues to change. So, let's return to this strange moon, and remember to support Dylan Beta on Patreon using the links below if you're a fan of this project. When we left off, the moon of Serena was home to a teeming menagerie of incredible life forms. Yet as the Middle Ultimacene period wears on, the planet has continued to cool, and in this changing environment, many species are now threatened. Somewhere on the steppe on a cold night, the last of the flying giants looms tall above the grasses. For 10 million years, their species, the storm sonars, ruled the skies as the largest flying life forms ever to exist. Now, without enough warm land to reproduce, this storm sonar will be the last of their kind. The loss of the storm sonars is emblematic of how more specialized species won't survive this changing world. And thus far on Serena, no species has had a story like the woodcrafters and the gravediggers. For centuries, these two life forms were enemies, predator and prey divided by a seemingly insurmountable gap. Yet now, these two species live together in peace, and remain in harmony for the next several millennia. In the words of the author, the triumphs and tragedies, the joys and the sadness of 10,000 years worth of lifetimes could fill their own story. But upon Serena, where chapters are more often measured in tens of millions of years, their time together is just a dog-eared page in the Book of Life. And this chapter too must come to a close, for the woodcrafters, eventually, go extinct. Always a small population with a highly specialized diet, as temperatures change, they find that the broadleaf forests they depend on disappear, and soon only one woodcrafter remains. On nights where the skies are clear, the elderly last woodcrafter stands on the shore of the ocean and looks out at the horizon. Most nights her small companion, a chattering sparrow gull simply called Bird, joins her. As a chatterer, Bird possesses the ability to mimic the woodcrafter's language, even if they can't grasp the full meaning of the words. Yet on nights like this, when the last woodcrafter repeats the phrase, I love you, Bird, to their dear friend, Bird understands that they are cared for. After a long life, the elderly last woodcrafter comes to rest surrounded by her gravedigger family. In her lifetime, she's seen the gravediggers achieve things she never knew were possible, harnessing blazing lights in their hands and shaping tools unlike anything her kind had made. What's more, the gravediggers have begun to weave grasses into floating structures, upon which they ride out into the sea for days at a time. The last woodcrafter knows the gravediggers will continue to change the world, and urges them to explore what lies beyond the horizon. And just before the last woodcrafter closes her eyes, she sees glimpses of a cosmic story she can't understand. Images of a small bird, a little fish, Moments long before her time, and moments yet to occur. And through it all, the last woodcrafter feels a strange presence, who tells her she's done well. And then, the page turns to another chapter, and the last woodcrafter is no more. Her gravedigger family lay her to rest on the hill overlooking the sunset she so enjoyed. In an act that brings the saga of two species to a close, this is the very last time the gravediggers shall dig a pit for a woodcrafter. Her companion bird lands upon her antler, for some time not understanding why their friend is silent. Bird stays in the gravedigger village for a few days, watching them cast out to sea. The gravediggers are determined to fulfill the final wishes of the woodcrafter, and chart what lies beyond the horizon. 
The last woodcrafter told them that in a world as big as this one, there had to be more intelligent species like themselves. Somewhere out upon the sea, they hoped to fulfill the dream of their dear friend. And Bird flies off on their own, beyond the beach they know so well, but they never forget the last woodcrafter, or the phrase, I love you, Bird, which they repeat to their children, who like Bird do not understand the meaning, but understand the context in which to use these words. For the Chatterers are, in fact, the descendants of the last babbling jays, the first advanced intelligent life to emerge for a brief time on Serena all those eons ago. And while Chatterers aren't as intelligent as their ancestors from the Pangea scene, they are a species to keep an eye on. Through the coming generations, the last woodcrafter lives on in the words the wild Chatterers affectionately whisper to each other, carrying her memory across the stretch of time. And out to sea, the gravediggers have found a new, brighter era has begun, the Ocean Age. As Serena has continued to cool, the majority of the plant and animal life have become reliant upon an equatorial ocean between the massive ice sheets of the north and south. While the sea level has technically dropped, in this period the oceans rise to greater importance than ever before in Serena's history. While braving these waters, the gravediggers will have to contend with all manner of life. Swimming near the surface are the gigantic oceanic pikebirds. While they look like fish, as their name implies, pikebirds are, in fact, birds, specifically metamorph birds, a clade which have managed to conquer all manners of niches across Serena thanks to their highly variable biology. Pikebirds evolve from tadpole-like larvae over millions of years, with the laws of hydrodynamics and convergent evolution shaping them into remarkably fish-like organisms. And as long as food remains abundant, these fish birds will likely continue to flourish. But the seas of the early ocean age aren't just populated by aquatic birds. The sea dragon is a descendant of fish like the swordtail, and is a highly successful species, albeit the last of their particular group. Able to breathe atmospheric air for a short period, the sea dragon has converged on a niche not dissimilar from Earth crocodiles. And anyone familiar with Earth's natural history knows that the crocodile niche is a pretty enviable long-term gig, so to speak, as crocodiles have stuck around since the age of the dinosaurs. And at 15 feet, or 4.5 meters, the sea dragons are massive predators, but they're far from the largest things patrolling these oceans. Elsewhere upon the waves, a huge horde of gnashing teeth and shifting legs moves upon the surface. This is a sea Shoggoth, and it's a colony of the most unexpected creature, the ant. Left on Serena as a food source millions of years ago, the unassuming ants have quietly been evolving in the margins since the beginning of this epoch. By the early Ultimacene, certain ant colonies had adapted to move in super colonies millions strong, devouring everything too slow to escape their advance through the underbrush. And now, in the Ocean Age, the descendants of these ravenous colonies have taken to the sea, functioning like a single massive predator. With many sea Shoggoths more than 30 feet, or 9 meters across, they require a tremendous amount of food to function. Once a humble food source, these ants are now the hunters. Other species need to watch their backs. But the social gravediggers are thriving. Just 5,000 years after the last woodcrafter, they've become a skilled, seafaring civilization, with traps, tools, and a written language. Metalworking, however, is difficult in such an environment, and has never been discovered, so their technological growth has remained largely unchanged for many centuries. Yet in all that time, the gravediggers haven't forgotten the last woodcrafter's message. From oral traditions and art like this tablet, the memory of their lost friends has been kept alive. The gravediggers have immortalized the woodcrafters as parent-like figures who help show them the value of life different from themselves. As a result, modern gravedigger culture emphasizes the gravediggers are only a small part of a wider food web and that somewhere in the ocean, there must be other intelligent life forms. Little do they know that deep below the water's surface, another intelligence has indeed developed in the form of the daydreamers. These life forms have been evolving, unnoticed, under the waves since before the rise of the woodcrafters. And in that time, the daydreamers developed a way of thinking which is entirely unique. 
We've actually met the ancestor of the Daydreamers before in this saga, in the form of the Sea Strikers, a group of predators with intelligence roughly analogous to a dolphin's. The Sea Strikers learned to farm and feed upon the porplets, a type of dolphinch that were also quite intelligent. And in the modern day, the Daydreamers have evolved a truly distinctive form of intelligence. Their brain is divided into two hemispheres that can function independently of each other, so that one half can sleep while the other remains active. Strange as this might sound, the brain hemispheres of certain dolphins can also do this to a lesser extent. But the experience of having a brain like a daydreamer would be strange indeed, because the daydreamer dreams while wide awake. Taking these dreams as visions and prophecies, the daydreamers are a highly spiritual populace. And there is one legend that stands out from the others. A creation myth, glimpsed through shifting dreams, of how Serena came to be. According to the daydreamers, in the beginning, a mysterious creator was alone in the void. To amuse themselves, they began to build, forming something from the nothing until the world itself was drawn into creation. The creator forged the air, the water, and the land, and all of the life that dwelled upon the three realms. Then the creator gazed down from above, and grew curious. The creator wished to experience the new world, not from the outside, but from within. And so, the creator fractured their essence into thirds. One soared off into the limitless sky, the next walked upon the shores and far beyond. And there they continued to reshape and change the land as they saw fit. The last settled in the lowest realm, using their strong flippers to dive down deep into the seas. And the daydreamers believe that one day, the three splinters will find one another again, and the creator will finish its journey. It's a fascinating tale, and perhaps some form of truth lies hidden in the daydreamers' mythos. In any case, while the story is one of unity, a dangerous societal rift currently exists between two distinct daydreamer populations. The undersea daydreamer populations are divided between a group called the Fishers and a group called the Pastoralists. The Fishers feed entirely on small aquatic life, and have a close alliance with the intelligent Luddies, a relative of the porplets they once farmed. The Fishers are a uniquely social and curious group, and have taken on an almost parental role in keeping the Luddies safe from predators. In contrast, the Pastoralists live a very different lifestyle. They continue the ancient survival strategy of farming porplets for food, which is reflected in their larger, serrated beaks. The porplets, however, are much changed, becoming the Nop, a livestock species almost too rotund to swim and blissfully unable to comprehend their situation. Indeed, the Nop can only survive thanks to the protection of their pastoralist farmhands. This complicated situation, however, has led to a seemingly endless cold war between the two populations, with the Fishers seeing the Pastoralists as evil and the Pastoralists seeing the Fishers as bizarre extremists. Yet now, an ancient threat is emerging that threatens both populations. For there is another, long-lost faction of daydreamers. These are the Warmongers, a huge offshoot that evolved to hunt wild prey in the distant open oceans. They diverged even before the Fishers and the Pastoralists split off, and now this isolationist subset has found their cousins again. And the warmongers have their own beliefs, that they alone are the sole descendants of a dead god, and therefore are above all other life, including the daydreamers. The jaws of the warmongers don't distinguish between Fishers and Pastoralists, and now an all-out war is beginning. But the other daydreamers have hope, Hope because the Fishers believe that they have found another aspect of the Creator from their most sacred myth. For some time now, the ever-curious Fishers have been aware of the Gravediggers, finding their tools upon the ocean floor, strange relics from another realm. Many Fishers come to wonder if perhaps these strange creatures are one of the lost essences of their supposed creators. And with the warmonger threat on the rise, the Fishers have decided to, at last, make contact with the strange creatures from the surface. The first gravediggers to be greeted by a talking whale urgently pleading for their help were surely confused. And indeed, the first Fishers able to mimic the gravediggers' slow, guttural language are imperfect messengers at best. But the gravediggers are eager to listen. News of talking whales travels quickly, 
as it is the fulfillment of the gravedigger's own mythos, just as it is the fisher's, to meet another intelligent species. And as communication improves and the danger of the warmongers becomes clear, the gravediggers realize it will take both the fishers and the pastoralists united to stop them. And while neither side believes an alliance is possible, for once they have a common ally and a common enemy. But the warmongers have been watching. A select few know the daydreamers have allied with mysterious animals from above the water and see the gravediggers as a threat to warmonger culture. After all, the advanced gravediggers seem like living proof the daydreamer creation story has more truth than they assumed. With their size and strength, what chance would the puny gravediggers have against them? But indeed, by dragging the gravediggers into the war, the warmongers make a fatal mistake. In their next battle with the daydreamers, fishers and pastoralists strike with poison spears that the warmongers can't comprehend and wear stark white plates and bones that block the force of their jaws. With armor and weapons created by the gravediggers, the daydreamers are now more than a match for the warmonger legions. But the warmongers aren't as homogenous as they first appear. They too are made of different groups, forged from generations of struggle, and many are only seeking to survive. And as the tides of war change, young warmongers question their allegiance to their leader. After much suffering, the old figures of power are violently cast out, and the warmonger ranks are shattered from within, and the war for the ocean, at last, comes to an end. Healing and reconciliation do not come immediately, for such things are rarely so simple. The immediate fighting has ceased, yet the warmonger remnants are now leaderless and disrupted, and the fishers and pastoralists remain divided. Yet as the years become centuries and centuries become millennia, daydreamers begin to blend, guided in part by their allies from the land. Together, this coastal alliance of gravediggers and daydreamers will persist over a timescale no culture before them has ever come close to. And the gravediggers would never forget their oldest allies, the woodcrafters, who helped make all of this possible. There are many stories yet to be told, and questions yet to be answered, but that's all I can give away for now. The story of Serena is still ongoing, and if you find the project as thought-provoking as I do, please support Dylan Beta on Patreon to gain access to entries further along in Serena's future. I've got links in the description. And as always, thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this entry, please lend your support by liking, subscribing, and hitting the notification icon to stay up to date on all things curious. See you in the next video.